Yes. Federation of the Chamber of Commerce of India, uh, who has the FICCI, uh, which has made possible this workshop. The title is Driving Investment in Emerging Economies in the Changing Global Financial Environment. Uh, this theme is one that, of course, is uh, particularly relevant uh, to today's environment. This theme is of particular relevance today as we are all are, uh, keenly aware of the uh, global economic contraction and what that may mean for the telecommunications and the information and the communications uh, technology environment. As I was reflecting upon the theme of this uh, workshop, it occurred to me that uh, we have come to a point uh, which is, uh, is significant and which is a departure from what has been a rather uh, uh, continuous process of, of uh, evolution uh, in investment policies. Uh, and they have been, it, recur, it occurred to me to recall that uh, the telecommunications industry at the time before the great periods of liberalization in the early 1980s was one that was characterized as investment based on long-term planning, 30-year amortization of uh, equipment. It was uh, predicated on a rather sure anticipation of the user base. Um, and it was, a, it was in, a, in a word, a rather neat environment. It was also an environment uh, in which telephone companies were highly leveraged, but because they had very steady growth, and because of their control of their own investment, uh, that leverage uh, was sustainable. And then we er entered a new era. And that era, of course, uh, begins in the late uh, 90s uh, when we have, uh, for the first time, uh, the impact of the internet uh, uh, revolution upon all of our societies and, ec and ec economies, as well as upon uh, the way that telecommunications and information technology businesses uh, conduct their uh, investment. It was during that period uh, that we also saw uh, tremendous international flows of investment. Uh, as you recall, that was an era in which uh, privatization was, uh, had, uh, of course, uh, gotten a very strong hold on throughout uh, the world as uh, PTTs transform themselves into corporations and in turn into private uh, entities. It was the period in which liberalization had taken hold. And then you bring uh, internet into that uh, environment and we had a period in which we had great international flows of investment but also, uh, as in the case of the United States and elsewhere, uh, globally a tremendous amount of uh, domestic investment to accommodate the new uh, technology and the new medium of, of the internet. That continued despite the fact that we had uh, quite a downturn as the period of uh, irrational exuberance, as we referred to it, uh, uh, ended in about 2002 and the bottom went out on many of the investments that had taken place in anticipation of the over-exaggerated or the exaggerated anticipation of 
of uh, internet returns at the time. We went through that period and then we started another investment cycle into broadband uh, facilities. And many of our city's uh, streets were torn up as cables were being laid. Uh, the view being, a very traditional view, is that if you build it, they'll use it. And we were in a period in which, of course, they did not use it. Uh, but we had uh, the capabilities uh, in place. We then have come uh, into a period that's closer to our own, in which we began to, I think, develop rather sound investment strategies to accommodate the new technology of, of, of the Internet. And the facilities that, facilities that we had laid in the, the late 90s and the, and the early uh, period of, of this decade had begun to take hold and accommodate what was increasing use uh, uses uh, of the internet and new applications uh, and the subscriber base uh, began to uh, accelerate and not only in the developed world but throughout the world and so that the facilities that had been invested in had begun to be used and that uh, excess capacity uh, was beginning to um, uh, fade away and, and we, we were again in a very optimistic uh, investment uh, climate we now come to the era that we find ourselves in today, in which there is a, for reasons that are unrelated to telecommunications and the internet world, but a world in which we now see economic contraction. And we're all trying to determine what this may mean. And that's the subject of this workshop, is what does it mean to talk about an investment environment uh, in a period of global uh, recession, in a period of global economic contraction, what are the regulatory implications uh, of this world that we find ourselves in? What are perhaps the new economic models that would be suitable to carry us through and to sustain the kinds of growth rates uh, that we have seen in the last, uh, over the last decade? What are the new business models uh, that we would be looking to, uh, to carry through uh, this period? And, and again, and importantly, how do we sustain the growth uh, that we have enjoyed in terms of the number of uh, mobile users, the number of uh, internet users, uh, and again, as a worldwide phenomenon, uh, these growth rates have been uh, rather remarkable. So that's the kind of the context, if you will, for this workshop as we uh, call upon a, a distinguished group of experts who will look at this environment and will give us their best views on uh, how uh, we go forward uh, given the demands, the continuing demands uh, for communications uh, services and applications uh, and uh, the use, the inevitable and integral use of the internet in our, in our societies, economies, uh, and by governments. Let me now introduce uh, this uh, uh, distinguished group of uh, experts who will uh, uh, comment on these, on these issues. Uh, and let me do it uh, uh, in order here by, uh, to my left, I have Mr. Uh, Rashi uh, Sharia, uh, who is president of the uh, ISPI uh, Association, which is the Internet Service Providers Association of India. I have Mr. Jake Jennings, who is Executive Director of International External and Regulatory Affairs at AT&T. I have Art Riley, who is with Cisco uh, Systems. He is Senior Director, Strategic Technology Policy, uh, and he is the Chief Technology Officer uh, as, as a, in a role as a consulting uh, engineer. Lastly, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator for this workshop, and that's Mr. David Apisami, who is the Chief Communications Officer for CIFI. Uh, and uh, I am now uh, going to uh, turn the workshop over to Mr. Apisami. I will return uh, both as a panelist and as uh, in my role then of summarizing the proceedings at the end of the workshop. David? Thank you, Dick. Um, 
Before we go further, Dick, on your behalf, let me introduce Graham. Graham Vickery is with the OECD. And we're very fortunate to have him here with us today because they've just completed a piece of research which highlights how different countries are responding to the global financial slowdown and what their priorities are in terms of investment. So to start this workshop and to perhaps set the base for discussion, I'd like to call upon Graham to present a few slides in terms of the slowdown, how it's affecting various countries, and the priorities of developing countries for investment. If you could just put up the slides, please. And could you show the first slide, please? That's it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be v going to be very brief um, because obviously this is a vast area to look at. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the long-term trends in the ICT industry in general um, and what is happening recently to set the stage for our discussion of investment. Because obviously our discussion of investment has to be based on what, is, what has happened recently and what is happening um, today and tomorrow. OECD has a, um, a very large macroeconomic forecasting group and they're relatively pessimistic for the OECD area for um, 2009, the last quarter of 2008 and certainly the first half of 2009. Despite that pessimism, I must say that um, they're still forecasting a growth for India of about 7% next year and a growth for China of about 8%. I think that might be slightly optimistic, but it shows that even though the OECD area in general, that's all the main countries and pretty well all of the countries in the OECD area, are, are in recession at the moment and are going to be in recession quite some time, growth outside of the OECD area is still going to be stronger. We might get a, a global recession, if you like, but it's going to be patchy unless um, you know the, the system changes somewhat from what, what we believe. So what I'm talking about is just the general picture, and I'm not going to talk very much about um, some uh, uh, exceptions. So first of all, the first half of 2008, despite what was happening in the financial markets starting in the, U in the US and then spreading to other countries, was good. So that means that overall 2008, when you look at the aggregate numbers, 2008 has not been a particular, it's been a slowdown year, but it's been not a bad year. Um, and that is because you only really started to see slowdowns or downturns or negative growth uh, across large sec sections of at least the OECD area starting around about September, October. That does mean as well that the national statistics, the official national statistics, um, a, a, apart from projections, do not yet catch up with this. So you, you still see that they are still saying around about zero or so, just the way that the statistics are collected. So we won't know officially what the numbers are for the ICT sector for, for 2008 and for another couple of months, even though we know they've been turning down quite sharply. Overall, we'd say the outlook is negative for 2009. That's a global, global level because the OECD is still about 70-odd percent of, the, of global GDP. But still exceptions. As I said before, and I'll repeat it, India and China looking a lot better. You know, uh, India has to grow quite rapidly to have any growth at all, but you know, it, it's still, still looking much better. The two things to keep in mind when we're thinking about this discussion is there's two major economic effects at play here. One is what's called the accelerator effect or the decelerator effect in this, at this stage, where the growth or decline in investment is the second derivative of what's happening in the real economy in the sense it's magnified. So in boom years, investment will grow at double or triple the rate of, it's the rate of change in the, in, in the change, in fact, which um, drives investment. So it'll, it'll grow at something like double or triple the rate of growth in GDP. When it declines, it'll de it collapse as well at the same sort of rate. Um, that's what historically has happened. But in some ways, you know, the ICT sector in general, the demand for, for investment in the ICT sector and for ICT investment goods has been slightly less based on the accelerator effect and the decelerator effect the last few years. So that means possibly you're not going to get the very wild fluctuations you've seen, for example, in 2001, 2002. The other problem, of course, is consumption effect. Uh, sorry, the wealth effect um, uh, on the consumer side, which will then be picked up in investment. Um, and the important thing is that if people generally feel 
poorer, they will tend to buy less. And it doesn't matter if the income remains the same, if they're seeing declines or stagnancy in the, the pr price of their houses and declines in stock market um, portfolios, they feel less wealthy, so therefore they tend to actually hoard money or do something else with it. And that means they tend to spend less, and that's something obviously which is very important for investment. The other thing, of course, is that in most countries, unemployment is rising. It's nothing like it was in the 1980s, but it still is rising, and it's rising rapidly. So, and when people are unemployed, they tend not to buy anything either. So that you've got two effects on the consumer side, which I think are very, very important. In terms of what's happened recently, you're, you're getting globally a much more balanced picture of um, recent growth uh, and the flattening off and declines at the moment. At one stage you had the United States clearly in the lead in the upturn in from say 2003 through to 2005-06. But now you see Europe, Japan and the US much more tightly integrated than they were in the sense they're going up and down at around the same speed rather than one leading the other. Now the US has traditionally pulled out of downturns faster than the other countries or the other groups, that's Europe and Japan for example. So we can sort of think that they might start turning up at the end of next year before Europe and Japan do. But that's you know if things are the same as, uh, as before and if the financial market crisis um, is about as severe everywhere as it is in the United States, which it might not be of course. Um, Again, in general, ICT growth has been highest in consumer, internet-related, service support systems, all those service and, and new areas which we're going to talk about today. So again, growth and investment should come in, in those areas. Finally, um, I'll just I'll talk very briefly um, towards the end of this intervention a little bit about investment um, and what governments can do on the investment side. This is a little bit more detail on um, what I spoke about in the, re in the, the previous slide. Um, it is worthwhile remembering that, for example, although output is slowing very rapidly or is turned down in Japan and Europe, and U US it's definitely down, the A Asian countries are still growing, but they're slowing. They're growing but slowing, but they're still growing quite rapidly. And Indian growth, for example, in this whole area is, is the, the IT services growth. Um, you know, India is by far the largest exporter of IT services in the world, huge surplus nothing very much on the on the product side but a huge amount on the service side we know all that um, but you're also seeing a, a shift of total ICT markets now there's probably about 75 percent in the OECD area and about 25 percent in non-OECD countries and that's again if you're going to talk about something like decoupling or the or the world sort of splitting into two separate groups which we haven't seen so far you're going to see much more rapid growth still although declining, um, outside the OECD area and in some of the non-OECD countries. You see that India, for example, was in the top, it was, uh, it was, I think, about number 22 out of the top 25 market growth positions for ICT goods and services in the period 2000 to 2007 and growing much more rapidly than, than any other OECD country. Um, I'll just briefly talk about IC ICT firms and the top 250 ICT firms, um, again, they performed very well until the middle of this year. And then if you look at the quarterly res uh, results reported um, starting in October and still reporting for some com companies, quarter three was not so good in general. But again, IT services, software firms, internet firms were performing quite well uniformly. And in other sectors, the p picture was much more mixed. So again, you're likely to see a mixed pattern of investment and a mixed pattern of growth, and I think this is likely to continue. Um, just when we talk about the top 250 ICT firms, India has four firms in that top 250. A few years ago it had none, but now it's got four, and I've just listed them up there. And they're actually one um, telephone company, one uh, uh, which is Bharti Airtel, mobile operator, and then you've got Tata Consultancy, or Tata Consultants, um, Ypro, um, Infosys, and they're all in the, in the top 250. And there's some other companies which are on the edge as well, and they're all 
well over three billion or three three billion certainly this year and they're in the top lower third but they're growing very rapidly they're growing at 40 to 50 percent a year or have been at least so again it shows that Indian companies are coming in very nicely into this this picture this slide and this is my second the last one this shows two things one is that if you think of semiconductors on the good side of semiconductors as being a leading indicator and it has in the past a leading indicator of what's happening in the the real economy you can see that our projections for 2009 shows that the semiconductor industry is probably going to decline by five to six percent next year this is based on the semiconductor industry association data and we've then split it out into into segments that's one thing so you see the decline but the decline for next year is nowhere near as sharp as it was in uh, 2001, 2002, for example, we had a, a quite an amazing drop of about 30%. So, so far, we would say it's declining. Now, semiconductors magnifies the changes, as I said. It's a much more cyclical indicator. But so far, um, the best we can see is that it's slowing and it's dropping, but it's not dropping spectac spectacularly as it did in the previous downturn. The important part of that graph is the top purple part, the purple prose part on the top um, of the graph. Um, and that shows that 50% of the of semiconductor markets, that's where semiconductors are actually converted into products, is now in Asia, largely in China and the uh, countries around China. That's excluding Japan. Japan is not in that group. You can see it's China, Korea, um, Chinese Taipei and countries such as Malaysia, etc. They're the ones who are consuming semiconductors and they've now got 50% of the world's consumption and manufacture of all, all these goods, partly for export, but markets is, are growing very, very rapidly as well. As a smaller side, although the goods side of the industry in India is not as strong as the services side, the biggest export of um, ICT goods from India is in fact semiconductors, which is interesting. Finally, policy, which is what we're going to talk about here. And we surveyed all of the OECD countries at the start of this year and asked them what they thought was the highest priority, what was rising, what was dropping, and where they were putting the most money. And we then put those three ways of looking at um, policy priorities into one composite indicator. And I think for this group, the four at the top of what were what OECD countries were saying were their top policy priorities at the start of the year and the important ones. One is government online. That's governments making themselves more efficient. Oh, sorry. The next one. Sorry. I skipped over one to speed things up a bit. Um, so that um, it's governments online, governments as model users, governments trying to make themselves more efficient as one way of um, ICT policy trying to focus on what governments can do and I think that's realistic. The second highest priority, almost the same level as um, governments online or, or e-government e if you wish, um, is broadband, trying to look at um, broadband coverage, mostly fixed broadband still, um, countries starting to look at mobile broadband but bo mostly still at fixed broadband and trying to think about if you have very high coverage, then what do you do about um, handicapped people, you know, excluded people, etc. ICT R&D, and finally, I IT education. I won't go through the rest of the list. There's about 35 different policy areas in the list. But those four, I think, are very important for this group. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Those were the top four that uh, Graham actually elaborated on. But if you saw the top 10, most of them were ICT related, including the ability to disperse innovation, IT innovation across the populace, and so on. OK, that's kind of set the stage for our discussion. I have a number of questions, which I will address to the distinguished panel here. And uh, towards the end, uh, we will open it up to the audience if there's time. OK, the first question that I have, and this is addressed primarily to um, people other than Rajesh, because we're talking about investing into India. It's well known and acknowledged that the emerging economies offer opportunities for investment in various areas. But in the financial downturn, what are the kind of key considerations of business in evaluating these opportunities and taking an investment decision? 
What I mean to say is, it's not just a market or the market opportunity. It has to be larger than that. It has to be long term, it has to be multiple parameters. So what would be the interest to business at this point of time in investing in opportunities in emerging economies? Yes, uh, th thank you very much, uh, David, for the question, and thank you very much to the uh, Indian Chamber of Commerce for the opportunities to participate here. You know, in, in looking at the uh, uh, you know, at this particular question and, and what are the issues, uh, obviously, uh, anytime you're looking to invest, you're looking to invest or outlay uh, some type of uh, uh, resource, money or people or in-kind contributions with the. Uh, idea that you'll recover it at some time in the future. And so one of the things you're looking for is a, is a stable environment in terms of rule of law, regulatory predictability, an environment in which you think that your investment is going to be uh, successful and, and it, it's something that you can in fact uh, manage and, and, and plan for. So that that's critically important. Uh, Cisco uh, has, in fact, made a decision to invest in, in India about three years ago. We announced that we would invest $1.2 billion in, in India. And the things that we looked at then were the trends. And uh, I might mention when I, when I say that is that we obviously were looking for the kinds of issues I mentioned, not with the idea that everything was perfect, but the fact that uh, there were certain things that were taking place and our expectations were that things would, would continue to progress along those lines. And so uh, in, in the process of investing, we've invested in, in, uh, in training. Uh, uh, many of you may be familiar with the fact that we have the Cisco Networking Academies around the world. Uh, today we have about 10,000 of them in 160 countries that are 280 hour program in uh, 15 languages including all six UN languages. Uh, 280 hours plus uh, laboratories that we provide in partnership with universities. And so in the case of India, there are 152 Cisco Networking Academies. Uh, and uh, e each one of them typically would have about uh, 50 uh, participants in the program, so it gives you some idea of the, the numbers involved. Globally, as I said, we have 10,000 in universities around the world with about 700,000 students today taking courses. Uh, this is important to us from the standpoint of when you look to do an investment, another thing that's obviously interest of interest is a model that is scalable and sustainable. And so by partnering with universities and with government, uh, we're able to, to achieve that. So those are some of the things that we're do, doing right now. Uh, perhaps I can get back to some other issues later. Thank you, Art. Jake, would you like to? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, just checking, is, it, is this on? Yeah. yeah. First of all, th thank you, uh, David, for inviting us here. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here in India, and uh, obviously our condolences go out to the, uh, the victims of the recent terrorist tragedy. Uh, and we, but we are very happy to be here in India in spite of that, and thank you for your invitation. Uh, your question is dead on, is straight to the point of why would firms invest in an emerging market or even an existing market? Uh, there are some structural issues that we look at 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 and um, in addition to just the general market conditions. Um, obviously, the, the initial uh, issues are size of the market, revenue opportunity, uh, is there a demand for the good or the product? Uh, it, it's almost your basic uh, microeconomic issues. On top of those, um, as Graham went through, um, as the... Um, the world economy is tightening and getting tighter, it seems, every month. Uh, there are some structural issues that, uh, at, at least at our company, undergo a lot more scrutiny. Uh, these structural issues are touched upon. Um, you know, it's everything from, is a market open to entry? Is a market open to investment? Are there limitations on what we call foreign direct investment? Uh, if, as the times get tougher, we look at those much closer. How much control would our company have if we entered a market? Some countries limit uh, what we call FDI, or foreign direct investment. Uh, the, the more our investment is limited, the more control we have, uh, the more difficult it is for us to actually enter that market. Uh, because, again, when we're talking investment, 
we're talking capital, primarily financial capital. And as a company, when we invest that, our shareholders expect a return. Uh, uh, Dick Beard was um, uh, made reference to a 30-year return on investment. I think it's fair to say that we are no longer in that environment. Uh, I don't know exactly if the number is three years, four years, five years, but it certainly is not 30 years. So these, uh, these structural issues that, that we undergo, or we look at, everything from licensing requirements. Uh, if AT&T, if, if we roll out a new product, what's the regulatory policy that we're going to have to uh, undergo to actually roll that out? Can we respond to the market? Or is there a six month, nine month, or 12 month delay in applying for a license to provide the service? Uh, those are the type of issues. And one thing I don't want lost in this discussion, it's, it's not just about investment, but what does investment in infrastructure, uh, broadband do for an economy? J just if I can just tick off a few issues. Th there's the obvious economic and social development. Uh, E-governance, uh, Graham mentioned the ability for governments to become more efficient, but it's also an opportunity for governments to become more accountable. If there's broadband infrastructure, if consumers, if uh, people have access to that information, then they can actually go online and see what are their tax dollars being spent on. More and more governments are putting that information out on the web, but it's not enough just to put it on the web. Can you have access to it? Uh, other issues such as health care, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, the ability to uh, everything from perform robotic surgery uh, to the ability to have a second opinion on, on a uh, disease or a consultation. There's tremendous benefits, tremendous efficiencies that's, that can be gained. Education, the ability to take a course online, live, in person, even though you're sitting at your house. Uh, and finally, Energy sustainability. Uh, it's one thing that you no longer may be able to telecommute, but are you able to share other information uh, with broadband, do more than you wouldn't do otherwise? So, you know, I, I don't want the benefits to get lost. This is not investment for investment's sake. Um, there's business opportunities, but there's also societal opportunities. And as governments, as policymakers look to these issues, uh, I'd suggest looking first at the structural issues. And the slide on that we can talk about later. But to the extent those structural issues have been addressed, and they're still what economists would call a market failure, you know, what are the tools that governments, that policymakers can undergo to stimulate that investment? Uh, for example, in the United States, there is discussion about a, uh, another stimulus package, looking at uh, essentially infrastructure investments. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission recently went through a proceeding, the FCC, and found out that most, uh, a number of healthcare providers do not have broadband infrastructure. So they looked at a program where they rolled out government funds to incentivize, provide an investment opportunity so that parties could build the infrastructure and see a return on that. So, you know, I guess to summarize, there's not a one size fits all approach there are a number of issues that need to be gone through and examined. Thank you, Jake. Dick, would you like to add to that? Well, I, I think that uh, this has been, um, these, uh, th these uh, criteria for deciding on investments, I think, are uh, the ones that are well established. to know to what extent um, we still have uh, some, there's a change in attitude. And that is to say that if there is, uh, what I would take from our panelists that have spoken so far is that despite the economic contraction, uh, that it's basically business as usual in terms of how, where you judge your markets. And that if that is the case, that is a conclusion that we should uh, underscore. But if there is to be differences now as a result of this uh, of the global uh, uh, contraction, uh, then uh, we should highlight uh, those differences. Let me put it, therefore, in this context. We're going to go into a period of, uh, of heightened prioritization. That will mean that market 
states that, that, um, that are most certain would, it would seem to me, be those markets that will get the investment. I think, secondly, we, would, we will see uh, an increased emphasis on partnership. If we continue, as Graham's data indicates, if we continue to see growth being sustained outside the OECD, and if India and China remain uh, countries with uh, significant growth rates, then the conclusion that I would reach is that the OECD countries will be looking for partnerships in India and China. Yeah. And that's good news for those two countries. Um, but it also means, uh, however, uh, that uh, the kinds of factors of rule of law, of, uh, of uh, training requirements, the control of business in the country, uh, while they're important, it may also mean that because of the different difficulties in the OECD countries, that the hard reality of growth will drive investment. Uh, so what uh, I think we're hearing uh, is that the criteria that we've used in the past are important, will remain important, but for OECD countries, the countries that will get the highest degree of investment are those countries like India and China with sustainable growth rates where OECD countries can partner. Thank you. We come back to... Go right there. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to just comment, if I could, on, on Dick's uh, suggestion. And one of the things I should mention with regard to Cisco is that Cisco developed, uh, you know, almost with our formation, a, a different business model than the traditional one in terms of a manufacturer that has manufacturing facilities in country, develops a product, manufactures it, and ships it to someone in a market around the world. Our model from the, almost the beginning. Uh, in terms of being scalable and, and providing a product was, one, we're an element in an ecosystem. Uh, Cisco was in some places referred to as the plumber of the internet. We developed the, kind of the hardware and the software that's the core network, but we're a part of an ecosystem that depends upon obviously users and the, the genius of the internet is the fact that people at the edges create content and we've talked about that. So the user is critical to our, our, our ecosystem, but then obviously the service provider that provide services to customers. Uh, that, that they're critically important. They're part of our ecosystem, but also appliance manufacturers. I see my colleague Ilka from Nokia Siemens in, in the audience here. Uh, so, so their kind of product is important. To, and, and so in developing that, what we have is a global supply chain that develops the Cisco product as part of an ecosystem with many other partners around the world. So in the, in the case of Cisco, we're already a company that's highly uh, partnering in terms of the way we manufacture products, the way we deliver products through, you know, our sales people are l relatively limited in number, and then we have what we call sales channels. There are other companies that actually then sell our products around the world. So I, I talked about the internet is scalable and sustainable, and about our training is uh, as uh, scalable and sustainable. Our business model is one that says with a core number of people, you look to in fact partner with many others. So the point that Dick made is, is, is critical, but has been part of our model from the beginning, and that's why I highlighted training at the beginning, because when you have that kind of system, one of the things that's critically important is to have a capability that makes sure that all of your partners and all of your customers and, and your suppliers, et cetera, contract manufacturers, have in fact a base of capability uh, and, and Graham and I were talking on the side, when I talked about the Cisco Networking Academies, the idea with that program is that when, when a student goes through that program and they complete it, they can take an exam, and if they pass that exam, they are what's called Cisco certified, which basically is somewhat of a ticket to then get a, an entry level job. So even in the, the least developed countries, Cisco Networking Academy graduates get employment at like the 90, 95% rate in terms of the, the value of, of that. So. 
So, so that Dick's very, you know, Dick's correct with regard to that business model. The one thing that may be changing a little bit, as I see it, and, and that, that emphasis on people and a, a people-centric information society, I think is critical to us in terms of all those players. Uh, but, but the other thing that I, I wanted to, uh, to mention is that, that going forward, you know, we see the, the issue of uh, finance, and, and the current situation is about credit. Cisco is very fortunate in the f and 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 I just and there are a number of other companies like this. But by way of example, is we're very fortunate in as with all the difficulties that exist, we happen to have about 27 billion dollars in cash in the bank, and we have a Cisco capital. And so one of the things that I would expect, and we've we've announced this, is that perhaps some additional funds would be available through Cisco capital that would then be helpful. So when you consider that our annual sales are about $40 billion a year, and we have $27 billion that could be used to help perhaps reduce the risk, so that if you have a financial institution of some sort that looks at the, a project that may be a $10 million project, and if they say, okay, I can, can provide so much money at this particular interest rate, well, perhaps having a little bit of a leverage there with regard to Cisco Capital can either be viewed as reducing the amount that they might have to lend or reducing the, or increasing the interest rate or whatever it might be effectively to a financial. So you can leverage that in terms of uh, the market. So I think that will be an important factor going forward. Thanks, Art. But given the prevailing financial climate, I was wondering which bank that $27 billion is in. <laughs> 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 anyway, <laughs> okay, talking about the internet and the fact that uh, we are looking at reaching the next one billion and so on, and also recalling that last slide that Graham put up, where we talked about government online, the second point was broadband, the others were to do with the ICT diffusion, it were to do with investments in ICT innovation and so on. It was mostly to do with technology in a way and often coming off the internet. Can you share with us the trends towards internet protocol based services by communications companies globally? What drives investment in internet protocol based services? And if you could give us a few examples, it would be great. So um, who would like to start? Jake? Sure. Uh, one of the things we see at AT&T is you know, the global customers we serve. Uh, from a, a global business unit, our company serves a number of multinational corporations. I think uh, almost every company in the Fortune 1000 we provide service to. Uh, on the global um, internet protocol standards, consistency is a key issue for our customers. Uh, both consistency from an interoperability perspective, consistency from a quality of service perspective, and consistency from a repair and maintenance perspective, from a billing perspective, uh, from a single uh, one call resolution perspective. So our customers look to us to provide that singular point of contact. And w without the interoperability uh, you in the internet, you lose the consistency. So that if you have a company that has a hundred locations throughout the world, they expect their employees to have the same access in one country to another. And I think that highlights the, the need for a robust infrastructure that would then provide the ability to have the um, internet protocol writing atop the back. Rajesh, do you have? Yeah. <laughs> Not me personally, though. Please, <laughs> please. C could you call security when I leave here, David? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's too late. It's out there, and, and it's recorded probably over there somewhere. Um, yeah. The the, the, uh, the thank you very much for the question. It, as I mentioned, our relationship with, as part of this ecosystem, we have worked. We have a, a, an organization within Cisco that works with customers and potential customers and different uh, industry sectors, what we call verticals, and to try to understand the business. And so that particular business unit uh, 
uh, actually it's a consulting company inside Cisco, worked with a number of developing countries to kind of look at the situation with regard to introducing what's called next generation networks. And, and working with the service providers uh, in, in those developing countries, you know, we looked at it and, and talked to them. And, and uh, if you look at the business case, you can understand why, from their perspective, it may be a little uncertain. Uh, over the next three years, they may have to, with certain models, maybe you have to put out billions of dollars in order to introduce next generation network and have it be relative ubiquitous. And when you look at what might be the return on that investment, you say, gee whiz, you know, it, it, it may be somewhat problematic, uh, or at least the, it, the risk is there. But then when, when we looked at it and, and, and looked at the bigger picture of that developing country and recognized that in, in most developing countries of, you know, the kind of the moderate size, about 40 to 50 percent of their gross domestic product is associated with government, and government services. And then when you look at the government services and say, and based on studies, suppose you got one and a half percent productivity increase as a consequence of this. And you look at what the return would be over three years, you find out that the return on that investment to the government would be many times what the investment was that the service provider had. So if you look at the business model, not so much just on the service provider basis, but recognize that, glo that, that, that national impact, you can then say, well, really there's a case to be made for why the government would want to provide incentives to the service providers to do things that would allow them to provide government services and the, the, the things that Jake was mentioning earlier, e-education, health issues, other applications on broadband, and that that then would be critical to actually providing a, and we, we actually call this process country transformation. You utilize the ICT capabilities to actually impact not only the service provider and their market, but have that market actually be transformative in terms of the country and the infrastructure that it has. And the, the, the bigger benefits are realized by the country and not just by the service provider, but that provides incentives for the kind of policy issues that Jake and, and I were talking about before in terms of moving in a direction that allows this broader range of services. And to pick up on one of the points Jake made, obviously this is predicated on having broadband. If you're looking to provide that kind of capabilities into uh, in, into a, a country to provide health care and, and uh, uh, telemedicine, uh, education, and, and e-government services more broadly. And, and by the way, one of the elements of Cisco's investment in India was in e-government services, I, sh I should mention that. So that, that's a critical part of it. In conjunction with that, maybe to pick up on a very narrow point that, that David alluded to, uh, I had the uh, you know, honor of being a, a speaker uh, last spring at a, uh, the U UN's Commission on Science, Technology, and Development, and I was on a, uh, a panel with someone who was talking about voice over IP and was, uh, was suggesting that the voice over IP was something that was uh, uh, not good and that perhaps uh, the, what's called SIP, the, uh, the Session Initiation Protocol, uh, SIP, and H323, which is the ITU protocol for packet-based technologies, that those should be in fact blocked because of the fact they had consequences that they didn't like. And, and the point that I made then and I'll make here is voice over IP is critical to broadband. And so you, you have to have voice over IP. One, it's an application that's critical. So you know, if you were to not let, allow voice over IP over broadband, then it would say everyone would have a broadband service and they'd have to buy some other service in addition. Why not integrate it? You obviously get the, the benefit of both. The second is that when you look at web 2.0 types of applications, many of them are based on voice over IP protocols. I mean, one of, Cisco a few years ago uh, bought a company called WebEx, which provides collaboration capabilities. Web, uh, uh, WebEx is based on being able to provide voice at the same time you're providing data and video, et cetera. It's part of the package, it's integrated. So if you block voice over IP, you would block that. Many universities are involved in collaboration software. So voice over IP is a critical element, not just as voice person to person speaking on the telephone, but as an integral element in many, many more 
uh, more sophisticated multi-media um, applications. And so that's very critical. So when we talk about the policy issues, I, I hope you get this picture of you look at it at a national level, not just at the service provider level. Look at the range of applications that can be provided from a government standpoint, but make sure that in doing that you're very forward looking to not block applications that will be critical to your success longer term. Uh, Rajesh? Yeah. I think he, uh, the India has got a market to bring your $27 billion in India. <laughs> right now, we have touched only 4.5% of the total population, the broadband penetration. And our government, by 2010, is looking around 15 to 16%. Then you can understand that when the infrastructure for 15 and 16% is required, in the, into the India, all potential manufacturers or the equipment provider will love to come to India. You have touched a very good portion like the voice over internet protocol. Very recently, in August, our regulator has opened the policy, issued the regulation to open this VOIP for the ISP because the present telcos are not able to provide these services due to their business interest. Everybody knows that the India is the most talkative country. <laughs> we are the top. In spite of our lowest rates and high number of uses, our telecom company are able to sustain. That's the reason the bigger company of the other part of the world is looking at those companies to take over. NGN. NGN is a very good subject, which is now very strongly being discussed in India. Because as soon as the NGN is coming on the broadband, we will change the name of the NGN to BGN, Broadband Generation Network. Because voice is one of the application on the broadband. Looking at the illiteracy into the India, looking at the 65% of our total population belongs to rural area who are not so literate to use the PC. So if we think that the PC penetration will bring the broadband penetration, I doubt. Only the application over the broadband and the customer premises equipment should be so friendly like the Nokia, the person, the illiterate person should be able to use that on the broadband access. What we are looking for the rural, and our government is also interested in supporting, not supporting, but interested in supporting the rural health through broadband, rural education through broadband, e-governance, and e-commerce. Right now, I'm talking especially in the terms of India. Our Indian government is understanding that the IT growth means mobile growth. We are just growing in mobile. In spite of global melting down, last month, October, we have achieved 10.72 million broad, uh, mobile connection. Means along with the connectivity, the handsets are also being sold out. The foreign companies who want to come to India, right now they are trying to sell off their equipment, but they have to change their attitude while coming to India further, investing into the India. By coming into the revenue share basis, I think into the mobile sector, now this revenue share model is started going up. So I will suggest for bringing that 27 to India, you should come and invest into the India on a revenue share model. Then the Indian service provider will also be facilitated by the investment into the equipment. And they will be able to invest their money in OPEX rather than in CAPEX. Looking at the market size, looking at the applications, looking at the broad market of Indian area, 
आई थिंक कि इंडिया इज स्टिल अ वेरी पोटेंशियल मार्केट फॉर इन्वेस्टमेंट इन स्पाइट ऑफ वॉट्स एवर द मेल्टिंग डाउन इन अदर पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड बट द ड्यूटी ऑफ आवर इंडियन गवर्नमेंट इज ऑल्सो इंक्रीजिंग कि दे शुड कम आउट विद द लिबरल रेगुलेशन they should invest money now spent money in infrastructure rather than calling private investor to invest money because till that time private entrepreneurs will not be comfortable ki that the business case is going on till that time they are not going to invest so we should learn from the british telecom where the bt wholesale and the bt retail is working and the bt wholesale is providing the infrastructure while the other telcos are using the same infrastructure to provide the services into the retail market and that's the reason communication is growing thank you rajesh and thank you for the pitch for investment in india <laughs> i think that was well timed um, dick would you like to add to our gram Dick or Jay? Dick or Graham? You. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, so I think that from from our observation of the trends in uh, IT-based services, I think quite clearly the, the, the my my colleagues on the panel have um, indicated uh, important areas. Um, E-government. Sorry, uh, e-government is clearly a um, uh, a very important area uh, of, of growth. One of the things that we have found in recent years is that the governments around the world tend to be early adapters of technology, early adopters to technology, um, and this is has proven to be um, revolutionary in the provision of services. Uh, to con to emerging economies and 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 certainly there are uh, plenty of examples in India where the government has been able to provide uh, fundamental services uh, using uh, uh, communications uh, technology information technology in ways that they never have had been able to do uh, previously and that includes uh, of course such areas as education health service and so forth. So, uh, in terms of trends, uh, we quite clearly see e-government as a trend uh, globally. Uh, secondly, uh, one of the trends that we see, and I here I will speak particularly in areas uh, 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 in our hemisphere, but I think it is equally true in India and el and elsewhere, um, and that's voice uh, over IP. Now that may come in many forms, and there are various service providers uh, that are making available that service. So I won't name any individual brand, but I think you know the ones that I'm referring to. And what we have found is that, in particular, uh, those parts of our community which have uh, roots in, uh, for example, uh, Central America or Mexico. When they wish to communicate back home, they are users of that technology because it is obviously an inexpensive way to communicate uh, uh, back home. Um, and we find that this sort of uh, phenomenon is is being uh, uh, seen globally. That uh, voice over IP is not simply a service of the elites of the countries, but rather it is being um, Uh, adopted uh, by other uh, sectors of the society, population sectors, uh, for very fundamental economic reasons. So, uh, IP has provided uh, services to otherwise.